from Bradley. Uh, I need to share my screen. This talk is titled Layers, Folds, and Semi-Normal Information Processing. My name is Bradley Aliseab. I'm presenting on behalf of my co-author, Jesse Parent, or from the Orthogonal Research and Education Laboratory. So we start with this concept of a metabrain model. And we have an archive preprint. You can see at the left, details on that. And metabrain models are these layered models with layers having a different representational value. So you have, in this uh, example, you have sensory input coming out at a single point. And then you have a low level representation. And so this is something like a neural net, which is almost representation free. And this is opposed to the next level, which is the high level representation, which would be like a symbolic model. And this is sort of similar to a neurosymbolic model, except there are two differences. One is that there's significant communication between the lower and higher level of representation. And the other is this topological bending in different directions especially here we have the high level representation bending around the low level representation. So we can exploit this a little bit more and we can look at how maybe we can take these layered models and fold them over and make them functionally more explicit. So we can take this three layered metabrain, we can fold it twice, we fold it once and it's going inward, we fold it twice and it actually resembles a process in developmental biology called evagination. So vagination happens when a gut is formed in an animal embryo. And so this will become important later, but just suffice it to say, we can make these functionally salient models, computational models. So how does folding map to broader function? So this folding isn't just trivial. It actually does a number of things. The first is that it improves spatial communication between the layers. So modules of different parts, say in one layer or another, uh, come into to alignment or proximity. And you can see as this model folds twice, one side of the model comes into closer proximity to the other side. And so you can have connections form and things like that. Another thing is that it's a situated topology of folds and layers. So it actually resembles what you might find in an embodied agent. So this is a computational agent that we're really interested in applying this to. So we capture complex geometric transformations of development and cognition. Now these layers and folds enable things like learning and perception related to things like spatial rotation and motor exploration. So you can see that this is part of maybe a larger body or it can move on its own. Uh, layers and folds, however, can also enable things like array processing. So they can actually enable uh, things to be sensed or things to be active from multiple angles in multiple directions. And so this may act as sort of a distributed morphological pre-filtering of information uh, before it makes it to the actual model. And we'll see an example of this in a little bit. So biological layering and folding is actually a composite process in biology. And you see this in a number of systems. It's a, it has very broad applicability across biological systems. You see this in the neural convolutions on the surface of a mammalian brain, especially the human brain. And this is where the, the tissue becomes too large for the uh, skull and it, it folds to maximize its surface area. Uh, we also see folding and layering in embryonic morphogenesis. So at the bottom, we see an embryo where things are folded and layered and they form different uh, parts of the adult morphology. We also see the flatworm, which has an incredible capacity for regeneration, that there are these tissue types, these embryonic tissue types that become the cells and that's important in, not only in development, but regeneration. And even in your skin, you have layers of skin that interact. And it's very important in wound healing, for example, that those layers are regenerated in a certain way and that they maintain their integrity. So we are actually picked an example for the paper that we've uh, presented to the conference. And this is the, the gut. And this is an example of a human digestive system, the gut and some other features. So it's a very complex system topologically, and but it has a number of interesting features. 
So it actually has limited neuronal control. It has connections to the central nervous system, but also the peripheral nervous system. There are muscles that do very uh, immediate functional things, but there are also signals with the larger physiological system of the body. So you have autonomic control, for example, where the gut sends signals back and forth between there and the central nervous system. There are hormonal systems that it plugs into. It actually interacts with the microbiome, which is a, a separate bacterial uh, system. And then it interfaces with multiple processes, such as regenerative processes and other types of cells that are non-neuronal. And so we call this semi-neuronal because it's more than just this sort of neuronal information processing we're familiar with, with say like neural nets. So what kinds of computational representation are necessary in such a system? So before we get to that, it's important to realize that the gut system or the gut, uh, the gut brain axis is present all throughout the tree of life. And as such, it can have a number of different forms and a number of different formulations. So this semi-neuronal system, you see it again and again in different organisms, but it's very diverse and very different in those different systems. So you have fruit flies and you have zebrafish and you have uh, sea elegans, you have squid, hydra, or honeybee, and they all have different forms of this gut brain axis. So it's a very diverse set of morphologies. Um, they have different configurations, so, but this folding and layering is, is a common uh, element of this. And so this forms an integrated phenotype. This integrated phenotype can be combined with representational capacity through say, some sort of computational model or computational system to enable something called morphological computation. And that's very important in robotics, especially uh, with robots that are embodied. So you have this embodied computational system and it's important to have some sort of, uh, you know, it's important to maintain the geometry of the phenotype. So this is, now we move to sort of the development. So I showed you the uh, different organisms that are, uh, have gut brain axes, and they all have sort of different developmental uh, attributes to these systems. So they all develop from very, uh, kind of a very similar template, but they're very different in terms of how they unfold, how they fold and how they layer and how they ultimately function. So one, but one thing we can do with a computational model of a gut or any other type of semi-normal system is we can build what we call a differentiation tree. And from that differentiation tree, we can form these different layers and we can determine at what point they emerge. So this is the, I guess the, or we'll see in a minute, this is the lower layer, the lowest layer of our model. It emerges first. Then you have this branch point where you have a second layer that emerges, which is some sort of embedding, which we'll see. And then this third layer, which is differentiated a bit more with a few more steps, and you end up with this regulatory system that emerges on top. So we have uh, different branch points and they lead to these different layers of representational complexity. So this is done through a canalizing function, which I won't talk about here. This tree shows the progression of development from a layer of a layered system from a single precursor in black to these three layers that are defined by different models. Um, and so now we have this system where we go from A, B to C, so we're going upward. The lowest representational layer is something like muscle. It's like, like a muscular hydrostat, which is something you see in tentacles and, and sea creatures, and they control the different muscle ganglia. B is this uh, embedding, it's a neural network embedding, which allows a neural network to be embedded in space. And then C is this allostatic regulation layer, which has allows you to generate different states of regulation, physiological regulation. So they all kind of fit together in a certain way. And in what we've done with this model is we use something called connectivity and activation encoding to allow these different, the elements of these different layers to learn and adapt. So we start with the muscular hydrostat. And the muscular hydrostat, as I said, it undulates it when, you know, these muscle ganglia produce a force and they're coordinated through connections and they can manipulate things, they can exert a force in a certain direction. And so the muscles in the gut do a similar thing. And, but the interesting thing here is that you have a, st a starting point, a stimulus, as I showed in the first example, you have sensory information coming in. In this case, it's proprioceptive stimuli coming in. So if something is pushing against the muscle wall of the gut, then the muscle is activated. These different uh, parts of the hydrostat have different force values, plus or negative. And this is WIJF. This is our 
uh, encoding here for this activation. So different parts of this are activated and, and this is spatially explicit. So we go from one end of the gut to the other. The second part is this neural embedding, which I mentioned before. And these, what's interesting about this is that you have a different type of uh, activation encoding here, which is another act, uh, uh, connectivity matrix, but it's a different parameter. It's actually a different type of, uh, it's an output from this muscular hydrostat coming up and regulating these nodes. And this is a, a parameter C, so it, and it controls the connectivity. So it's almost like a neural network weight. And then third, you have this regulatory, regulatory state machine, which is where this these connectivity uh, values from here go up and affect the state of these. So the state then it generates a uh, matrix of states. And then there's feedback from this top layer down to the bottom layer. This stiffens or softens, softens this physical interface. So the stimuli affect this in different ways. So there's this loop that happens that uh, affects sort of the learning or the uh, acquisition of information here. So now we give examples of embodied information processing. So as I mentioned, this is an embodied uh, model and it, it's spatially explicit. And so this part here and this part here, they're spatially distinct. And sometimes they come into close proximity and sometimes they're very far away, but it's all spatially explicit. So we have things being exchanged. We have information coming in from the side. We have information being exchanged between layers. And so I wanna talk about a couple of examples of how we use layering and folding in different types of uh, computational agent systems. So the first one is this topological remapping in what, what, uh, Breitenberg vehicle. If you're familiar with Breitenberg vehicles, they're these uh, toy models of the brain, but they're also robotic models. So in this case, we have a brain case that's scaled relative to the body. And we have a small brain case. We start out with a single layer, a small brain case, and it's just a mapping between the sensor and effector here. And then this, in the second example, this brain case is, becomes layered and then it starts to grow out. So it becomes larger relative to the body size. And then the third example, we have this layered network where we have two layers where the network is doing different things here. And we're still going between the sensor and effector, but it's a much more com uh, complicated mapping. and we're adding neurons in here. And so we're able to build complexity in that way. The second is where we have a developing agent. And so we have these Brainberg vehicles again, where we have this whole developmental set of developmental stages from a single egg or a single unit to these things that are embryos that maybe are exposed to the environment in a limited way, and then they become these adult uh, agents. And what's interesting about this is that you can, you, you, uh, you can, uh, capitalize on this idea of different uh, germ layers. And so in this case, we have different germ layers that can take a shape on, you know, take on a shape and then uh, be sculpted by different things uh, as, you know, so you can have an internal model that arises from a single germ layer, the vehicle body, which is arises from another layer and a sensor and effector set of uh, nodes that arise from a third layer. And these can be reconfigured in development. So we can intervene early in development, reconfigure the agent and end up with different morphologies and then end up with different types of information processing. We have both layering and folding here. We have these different layers of uh, computational tissue as it were. And then we also have, you can have topological complexity where you can fold these and interdigitate them and do all sorts of interesting things. And so this is a, a simple tripoblastic or three uh, germ layer uh, you know, agent where they just have these three unspecified layers and then there's migration of these different parts of the layers and you end up with this uh, phenotype that's very complex and it's, you know, it, it gives you this adult form. And you have, you can embed your, uh, you know, layered models, you have a symbolic model in the middle and a generalized neural network on the outer edge and that gives you your layering. Finally, I want to talk about applications. So we envision this type of modeling to be applicable to building soft robots. So soft robots are robots that have compliant materials like, uh, you know, they're very flexible, they're very, uh, you know, they, they do a lot of interesting things like they can grab pencils, they can uh, swim, they can do other types of uh, locomotory activities like that cheetah at the top or the, the robotic cheetah. And in building soft robots, you know, we haven't really focused on the complexity of the controllers. We focused on the complexity of the phenotype. And so this controller, this type of controller 
could be used very effectively as it's embedded in the phenotype of the soft robot and it takes full advantage of the embodiment of those soft robots in different ways. So, you know, if you're holding a pencil, you can actually evolve, you can develop a robot to hold a pencil. You might mimic the human form, but you might also mimic some other type of form. Similarly, with the cheetah, you would have that similar uh, stride and gait, those sorts of um, attributes, but you might have some really interesting materials or interesting regulatory models or, or computational models that emerge to control that. And so that's where we want to head with this ultimately. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Hi, Bradley. Hi. Um, have you tried applying this to your open worm project? Did you actually manufacture like one of these and put it like warm or something or how does that work? Yeah, well, I mean, that that's something that is possible. Uh, we've done in open worm, we've done a lot of work with soft robots. So this would be maybe a next logical step, something, a very simple phenotype like that. But having that, you know, it's, it's pretty tractable, I think, for something like what I've just presented. Oh, okay. And how about physically manufacturing it? So would you actually go on the next step and actually make like plastic electronics or something like that or a silicone tissue possibly to manufacture this? Yeah, so you know you would have the you'd have to specify the different layers and the different types of models you would want to use for them, and the idea would be to configure them sort of in the context of <laughs> up. So a soft robot, you might have an outer layer that has like a very uh, compliant outer layer, and then a stiffer inner layer, and each of those would have a computational controller that are connected together. And they have different layers of representation, meaning that they <laughs> model their environment, they model things about the world um, in different ways. And they don't have to be the same as like, say, an actual animal that you're trying to mimic. Like in the case of the worm, it would be like, what do we want that worm to do? And, you know, we might have to be a little creative in terms of the computational representations you use in those different components. But and that would be, a, you know, that that's basically the way it would work. I see. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? So oh, I think this concludes the presentation of this block. Thank you to all presenters and to all members of the audience. The, ne the next activity we have on the schedule is a coffee break, through which the program will continue as scheduled. Thank you very much.